Okay, so this is the lecture for next week on Franklin D. So after William has arrived in England and established himself as the monarch, um, we now have everything, like every remaining monarch can trace their lineage back to William, including wills, uh, but including Queen Elizabeth II, they're all, they're all a part of this legacy from William the Conqueror. Um, this ushers in the era of Franklandy, and you're going to see what I mean, but also the House of Plantagenet. So that's not what it's called just yet, right? That actually enters in right on down here. Um, William is just William. And then there's the inheritance of his sons. Um, meanwhile, however, background, background to what's happening. So yes, William invades England. And then there is this new culture. Um, but what's happening on the continent and farther east, which I think is going to come into play as we start making bigger connections across the Atlantic. Um, so it's really important for us to know this global context. Um, the Crusades are beginning. So a little bit of background, a tiny bit, which is that after the fall of Rome, the Byzantine Empire is still standing in the east, but it is um, under increasing pressure from the Seljuk Turks. And the Seljuk Turks are Islamic, and the Byzantine Empire is Orthodox. And so this is a, an assault upon Christendom that the the Western Christians cannot countenance. And I shit you not, the schism between East and West is literally about something like, does the Holy Spirit proceed from the Father or is it its own form of deity? And they argued over the date of Easter and they just could not reconcile those. So that's why we have Eastern and Western. Um, but this, the Great Schism had not been in place for very long and the pope at the time pope urban he is thinking wait 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 if we send help to the byzantine empire for the the sake of of repulsing the seljuk turks then maybe we can reunify the church so that's his thing so he puts together the crusade as he's doing this um he <laughs> He can't get the military folks together, but he can whip up a lot of fervor in common people who decide that the way they're going to do this is make pilgrimage to the Holy Land, right? At this point, the Islamic Caliphate has controlled Jerusalem since it started being a thing, like since the Caliphate started being a thing, um, which means, so it's 1096, it's, I don't know, like 500 years um, this has never, ever been a Christian landscape. It was only very briefly a Jewish land, and then it was conquered a lot, right? Like we have Babylon, and then we have Persia, and then we have Alexander, and then we have Romans, and then there's Diaspora, and then after the Romans, there's a whole thing that falls apart, but then there's Byzantines, but they don't actually ever get to Jerusalem, so then there's the Caliphate, it's a whole thing, right? Like this has never been a Christian kingdom. And yet for some reason in the 11th century, 12th, 11th and 12th centuries, people just get it in their heads that it should be because Jesus was there. Um, so all these people, normal people, like children and um, peasants and whatever, they decide that they are going to walk from wherever they are in Europe to Jerusalem. And on their way, once they cross into Turkish territory, they are massacred, absolutely slaughtered. And I, part of <laughs> part of the function of this, it looks like, was for Pope Urban to be able to use this to whip up religious fervor in support of the Crusades. So now that everybody's been slaughtered, um, why don't we go on ahead and recruit a real crusade <laughs> with like people who fight? So this is called the Prince's Crusade, and this is the first crusade. And because this is a surprise attack, 
right? <laughs> like just out of nowhere, um, a bunch of people invade and the, the, the Seljuk Empire is not prepared and neither is the Fatimid Caliphate. Like nobody knows this is coming. Um, they actually are relatively successful and they establish a handful of crusader states, um, one of which is the Kingdom of Jerusalem. Then we have Tripoli, Antioch, Edessa, um, and then these are other powers in the region. So the green states are Islamic. Uh, they're no longer a unified empire. You have the caliphate. That's a more strictly Arabic um, caliphate. And then the, the Seljuk, this is the Turkish, but they are also Islamic, the Turkish Sultanate. So it is successful, largely because it's a surprise attack. Um, <laughs> but this initiates this massive, massive international war between the Seljuks and the Crusaders because the Seljuks are not going to take this shit lying down, right? They're like, um, no. So they fight back. Um, that's going on meanwhile. Um, in England, <laughs> so this is, this is part of what's happening. Um, then we also get <sighs> Franklin So William's sons inherit, uh, and then William's grandson but then William's great grandson, via his, you know, a not direct male line, um, Henry II, he gets super freaking greedy and he actually attacks, he invades, <laughs> he consolidates power um, in France and he invades, uh, oh, nope, <laughs> not, not there yet. He invades England and he pressures Stephen into making himself the heir to the throne instead of Stephen's own kids. Um, so Henry II, he's a very Beowulf kind of guy, right? Man, that Henry, he has got balls. So that's, that's part of what's going to be happening in England. Meanwhile... There's a second crusade. Why? Because the Seljuk Turks are like, um, hell no. And they take Edessa back and that precipitates the need for a second crusade. Um, it wasn't really very successful, but this part is really important to pay attention to. The only part that was even a minor success was the troops coming from the north. So this is a kind of pan-Germanic force. There are some Saxons, there are some Danes, there are some Normans, right? Like these folks who are all related to each other, um, they set out from England and they sail along the coast. And when they get here, the Portuguese... Uh, they are trying to do their own crusade in Iberia because apparently it is justified to fight against like all Muslims everywhere. And the Iberian Peninsula for most of the Middle Ages was mostly Muslim controlled. And so as a part of the crusades, these crusader forces, they get, they hop down here in Portugal and the, the Portuguese are trying to take Lisbon and they're not doing a very good job. And so the incoming Germanic forces are really helpful and they manage to take Lisbon and they manage to push Christian control of the Iberian Peninsula sort of down farther south. That's the only success. Everything that's going on over here is going horribly, horribly wrong. Um, so now we get back to Henry, right? So during Henry's reign is when we see a lot of this action in the Middle East. Um, so right before he succeeds to the throne upon the death of C Stephen, um, that's the second crusade. And now when he succeeds to the throne, Henry creates the Angevin Empire. And this is why I call it Franklandy, because it is not just England and Normandy, right? <laughs> yes, there's Normandy and yes, there's England. Um, but that would be like Englandy. But then there's all of this, right? He is descended from the Count of Anjou on his dad's side. That's what makes him a Plantagenet. And that also is what gives him this sort of middle French region um, in the west part of the French area at this point. Um, then there's the he becomes the Duke of Aquitaine upon his marriage to Eleanor. This is really interesting because actually Eleanor of Aquitaine was originally married off um, to 
uh, the Holy Roman Emperor, and then she gets involved in the Crusades and Edessa, and it's just kind of funny that she ends up right, like, way back out here, um, married to Henry, who's like, yeah, fuck the Crusades, I am gonna build my empire while everybody else is off fighting them. Um, so it's important to acknowledge that all of the rest of this territory, I'm going to go back one, all of the rest of this territory that you see as belonging to the Angevin Empire was added by conquest. Um, so one, for example, is Brittany, this sort of far west promontory of France. Um, but in all of this, this is just like encroachment on France, like actual France. And um, King Philip or King Louis, whichever one happens to be in charge at the time, is never happy about it. But Henry lives a really long time. And he, I mean, for the Middle Ages. And he makes a lot of, like, he makes a lot of incursions into spaces that aren't originally his. Including, don't forget, Ireland. So that's a thing that's happening. <laughs> But poor Henry, his sons are not the lion in winter, right? They are just not, not, not the same. His sons are all rebellious. They're all eager to inherit, which makes them dangerous. Um, and none of them can really hang on to, can like muscle the empire and keep it together in the way that he can. Um, and it's really important to note that by the time that Henry dies, Richard is the one who inherits and he was definitely not the oldest like that is not what was happening right Richard here he's the third son um these guys have already had plots and treason they've plotted against daddy which was a terrible choice um Richard does too a little bit but he manages to pull out of that and these these ones end up dead um and then these these three ladies they get married off there's a middle son he also ends up dead and the only one left um, after Richard is John. Uh, meanwhile, Third Crusade. And this is important because Richard is a part of it. So Richard is the King of England, um, but he decides to go on the Third Crusade, you know, for God and glory and all of that. And he leaves John in charge. And John does not do a good job, but we'll get to that. So the Third Crusade is the only other crusade that has even moderate success. So the First Crusade is the only one that is an out-and-out -out success, um, but the third one has a little bit of success. Here we go, right? So originally, uh, everybody had been pushed, or the, the Crusaders had been pushed back to Antioch um, and Tripoli, and those were the only remaining Crusader states, and they were little and tiny. Um, so when the Third Crusade arrives, they are, of course, going for Jerusalem. They are trying to bring Jerusalem back into the Crusader states against the forces of Saladin. This is not going well. This is not going well at all. Saladin has clearly a superior army, a superior fighting force, and a superior tactics. Like, Saladin is the shit, and the Crusaders are idiots. Um, they're also super aggressive, uh, what they do manage is to take Acre, which is on the coast, right? So this is a, an English itinerary by Matthew Paris, of all people, um, which means Matthew of Paris. But this is an English book, and it details the arrival. So the itinerary is how to make your pilgrimage to Jerusalem. And this is a century after the fact. So this is not recording what Richard is, what's happening with Richard. Richard is definitely dead at this point. But what's interesting is at the end of your itinerary, the place that you get to, this is the Holy Land. And here's Jerusalem, right? It's small. It's, um, um, and here's the big, very important crusader state of Acre. I wonder why Acre is so prominently featured. Maybe because it was the only thing that was successfully accomplished by the Third Crusade. And look, right here, we have Richard. That's Richard's coat of arms. That's So that's Richard's ship um, landing on in Acre and holding down the fort. Um, but this is a really good time to mention siege warfare. So standard military tactic of the Crusades is siege warfare. 
And what they essentially did to Acker is they blockaded it. So they had a sea blockade so that no ships could get in or, in or out with supplies. And then they surrounded the city on the outside. And this is a campaign of starvation. They essentially don't even need to fight uh, until... Or, or they don't have to fight. They can, they can force submission if they can outlast the individuals. Um, now, that's not totally, that's not their only strategy in this case. And there was some fighting, but they laid siege to it, specifically cutting people off from the, the outside and starving them to death. And once they were half starved and running out of provisions and running out of ammo, uh, that is when the Crusader forces would attack. So Richard leads these forces. He takes Ocker. Um, I actually don't know. I don't remember if this story about Richard is about Ocker or if it's the place that he took right before Ocker. And I forget the name of that city. But in one of these towns that he lays siege to, um, he... He wants to make a treaty with Saladin. Um, and he gets his pants in a bunch because Saladin won't treat with him directly. And Richard is pissed about this. This like offends his ego. And so here we are, Richard the Lionheart, right? The hero of Robin Hood, always thought of as like a heroic English king. Um, he is having a massive ego trip and because Saladin won't treat with him, uh, personally, which is maybe smart because he probably would have gotten assassinated. Um, <laughs> Richard decides to take all of the remaining Islamic survivors inside this city he has just conquered and line them up on the wall in the sight of Saladin and execute them, behead them. And that includes women and children, like the entire Islamic population of that town uh, was executed. And that was about 2000 people. Um, so yay, brave heroic Richard, I guess. Um, the end of the story is not good. <laughs> Richard ends up leaving kind of successful, but kind of not. Saladin is super pissed and doesn't even get to take it out on Richard because Richard hightails that shit out of there. <sighs> and then crusades go on and on and on and on um, for a hundred years and are never successful again. Oh, oh, yeah, Jerusalem, Acker. I forgot <laughs> that I gave you little pointers. Um, so back to Henry, right? Richard returns. Um, John has made a right royal mess of things. But when Richard dies, he does inherit. And between what he does while Richard is away and what he does in his own rule, he loses pretty much all of France. The only thing he hangs on to right here is Aquitaine. And the reason he hangs on to it is because he inherited it from his mom. Um, so... <laughs> That doesn't last, though. Um, but John loses the entire kingdom, basically, except for England. So he has to retreat to England, and John's shit flows downhill. So now he can't pick on people in France. He has to pick on the neighboring Celts. So that means the Scottish, the Irish, and the Welsh. Like, all of them. All of them. Um, so his, his dad had started the invasion of Ireland during his reign, Henry II. Um, but John had been successful there while daddy was around and when daddy died and john was either in control or on the throne he just kind of couldn't hang on to it the same way <sighs> and this leads us directly to the magna carta like john's shit is just too much for everybody and so the english people are like nah dude you don't have the right to just do whatever the fuck you want and actually you're kind of a shitty king and the magna carta is the first written document establishing a kind of constitution and a parliament with rights of the commons so the magna carta essentially limits the powers of the monarch and says no <laughs> like, like you are only legitimate this far you are not god and you do not have rights to do anything you want to and so if you're gonna fuck everything up we're gonna stop you and the we being the people 
Um, and by the people, we mean mostly the aristocracy. <laughs> but there is an establishment of parliament. And that gives somebody other than the king power to check the monarchy for the first time. That's really This really is kind of an innovation in the Western world, which is why the British are very proud of it. So um, five years ago, they just celebrated the 800th anniversary of the Magna Carta, um, which the British will claim makes them the oldest, uh, makes this the oldest constitution in the world, the oldest constitutional monarchy, et cetera, et cetera. That's sort of questionable because the Magna Carta is not a constitution. Nonetheless, we do have in England a check on monarchical power for the first time. That's a thing. Oh, but John, John just sucks. Right? He just kind of does. Luckily, his son Henry is not as bad. Um, so Henry inherits and the House of Plantagenet continues. Um, and succession goes pretty much fine as long as there is always an oldest son right so here we go henry takes it and then edward and then edward and then edward all oh, right <laughs> they're all named edward which definitely means they were all the oldest son um right junior just inherits daddy's throne but then <laughs> while this is going on right like let's look at the dates here 1296 through 1357 um we'll back up so here we are um at the end of the reign of Edward the first and all the way through part of Edward the third we have the wars of Scottish independence and I promise is gonna come back around for full circle it really will uh, so this is an ironic name because Scotland was independent and England was trying to make them not independent and so Scotland is fighting to maintain their independence. They are not fighting to free themselves from the British. Uh, but at some point, the Edwards, they get it in their head that they are the rightful heirs to the Scottish throne. And Robert the Bruce is like, um, fuck no, you're not. You need to back up. And he goes ahead and repulses them more than once. Uh, but in this in this particular period is when we start to see the development of another war technology. And we're going to come to that in a moment. Um, also, meanwhile, is the Hundred Years War starting. 13, it's more than 100 years, right? 1337 to 1453, England is fighting France. Why are they fighting France? Probably because they lost Franklin-y and they are bitter about it. Um, John, John, Jesus, John. He really, really, really fucked things up, didn't he? Um, anyhow, so there seems to be some kind of bitter blood feud going on between England and France. And so the English make war on the French for over a century, trying to reconquer space in France. And remember, they're all freaking related to each other, so they all have some kind of claim. And they're like, wait, but that was my cousin, and he died, and there's no heirs, so this is now mine, which gives me a foothold. And so now that I have this foothold, I'm going to gather an army. But the thing is, <laughs> it's not really just France, right? So you have these English territories, and this is just a snapshot. This is from 1415, but this is constantly in flux for over a century, right? We're talking 116 years of back and forth fighting. And the noble people are, they're going over there and they're dying off as they fight, which makes succession a problem. But it also means <laughs> um, France becomes a problem. And so does Joni, right? <laughs> don't forget about Joan of Arc. That is, this is where she comes in. Um, and don't forget, she's also against the English, heroically so. And they are soundly beaten. Um, but a key thing that comes out of this moment is the practice of Chevochi, right? An extra special invention of the English. And this is going to come back to us when we start talking about the the British or the English in America. So it's worth pausing to note this in its historical context. So Chepochi literally means horse charge, right? We get our word cavalry from the same root or the word for knight, chevalier, 
uh, comes from the same root. So does chivalry. Um, but it's not just a horse charge. So it is being done by free companies because the English in France do not have enough of a force to fight under regular rules of warfare. Um, so what they start doing instead is raiding and pillaging as a method of weakening their enemy. So it's literally a scorched earth campaign. They, they literally run around and burn shit to the ground and they are doing this to cut civilian peoples off from their crops, their food, their homes, their livestock, because if the people are weak, they cannot support their enemy. Excuse me. Um, and so this is what a free company is. They are small bands of essentially sanctioned marauders. Right. So they are sanctioned by the crown to do basically marauding. Um, and as they do this, they dispossess and kill a lot of non-military people, non-combatants, you might say. Um, they also terrorize. This is a part of the campaign. So they are targeting civilians, especially women and children. And yes, this does mean rape. This means killing babies. Um, this is a part of the thing and it's often credited to this period with the hundred years war, but actually what we find is that, <laughs> um, it's, hi, it's not, oh, look, we've got two visitors. I'm sure, I'm sure that, hey, come here. I'm sure this will be a welcome interruption. Come here. Yo, yo. Hi, hi. <laughs> okay, buddy. Okay, buddy. Okay, buddy. All right. Your face is messy. What's on your face? Do you have cobbler? Cobbler. Cobbler. Mm -hmm. Do you have huckleberries or blackberries? Anyhow. Um, yeah, so we're targeting civilians. That is our method of warfare. This is not unrelated to siege warfare, but it is a more explicit form of trying to target civilians so siege warfare yeah you can have beowulf here you go take it with you oh <laughs> see you later <laughs> come on come on you want to give me a kiss yeah. nope okay see you later bye 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 Um, where were we? Uh, the key thing is that siege warfare <sighs> starves people first. Um, whereas Chevochi is an active campaign of mass murder. Like, they, they burn the crops to the ground to make sure that anybody they missed also dies. Um, not because it is somehow less, um, less active. Anyway, that's not really the point. Um, so a thing to draw from this is that chivalry, which you see in medieval romance narratives, chivalry has always been a lie. It has never been real. It has never represented a real form of action or government. Um, romances romanticize a very ugly reality in order to deflect attention. Like they're a, they're a propaganda piece, essentially. They create heroic fictions around which a national pride could develop, right? But the things that they refer to, regardless of when this romance is written, like jousting and tournaments or aventure and unrequited love, all of that are not a part of the actual lived reality of any of the folks. Um, they're a form of escapism. And the jousting in the tournaments that we think of as, as like key to the Middle Ages, that's actually um, only an invention at the end of the Middle Ages because people were tired of everyone dying, right? They had been fighting for so long that they got tired of it. And so they played at fighting. So a thing to remember. Um, another note. <laughs> <clears throat> Chevochi is credited to the Hundred Years' War, but this practice of raping and pillaging does not seem new to me. 
Uh, so here I am doing the medievalist job of being like, um, actually, that's not new. Vikings? Hmm? Um, what about Germanic mercenary invaders of Britain? Or Roman Germanicus? Uh, who, who invaded, and this is a direct quote from Tacitus in translation, um, ravaged and burnt the country for 50 miles around. No pity was shown to age or sex. So this form of warfare is very old, but it also becomes a very specifically English legacy. Um, so here's, here's why. Um, so succession of the eldest son, it works until it doesn't. And <laughs> the big thing is the warfare, right? So the wars of Scottish independence, this is actually where Chevochi is first enacted. So before the Hundred Years' War, they start doing Chevochi in Scotland. And then we have Hen all right, interjection. Henry the Fourth. This is just a, an aside, FYI. Right, we have our French-speaking aristocracy from William forward. Right, that was 1066 to now. This is Henry, born in 1366. He is believed to be the first English monarch since before William, whose first language was English. Um, that's just an FYI. Anyway, Hundred Years' War. Back to that. Um, so that is all happening here. And what happens to succession is that as people die in the fighting, the line of succession becomes convoluted, right? So here's what ends up happening, right? Because they don't know who is actually closer. So yes, we have the House of Lancaster that splits off up here. But we also have the House of York that splits off right around the same time. And they are both equally... Um, descendants of the house of Plantagenet but by the time you have lots and lots of death and the throne going to the next cousin mother's son blah 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 on both sides you get to a point where the relationship to the line of succession is so convoluted that it is legitimate for one cousin to be like no I'm closer to the throne and the other one to be like no I am and for nobody to actually know which one is true and so of course fighting breaks out, right? Succession just goes all over the place and it bounces back and forth until the War of the Roses, which by the way, only it starts only three years after the Hundred Years War ends. <laughs> like they cannot stop killing each other. Um, but it ends with the succession of the Tudor um, house. So what happens is Henry, who is of the House of Lancaster, he agrees to marry Elizabeth of York. And that means that their offspring will be exactly one half Tudor and one half York. Or sorry, one half Lancaster and one half York. And this creates a new house, right? So Tudor is a descendant of the House of Plantagenet. But at this point, the relationships between the houses is so convoluted that he just starts over, right? He says, okay, we'll take your side, we'll take my side, we'll mush them together, and now we have um, an effective program of inheritance. <laughs> Let's put it that way. Um, this is where we get Henry VIII, and this might help contextualize him, although he's not gonna get less gross. Uh, this is why he is so anxious about producing an heir, because he is the first two-door heir. And so if he does not produce an heir, then the same thing that has been going on for, let's see, this resolves in uh, the late 1400s. So it's about 50 years that this fight goes on. Not quite. Um, that's all going to break out again right? He's only succeeded to the throne in 1509. This is not a distant memory. So whatever, his oldest child is Mary, can't inherit. His next oldest child is Elizabeth, can't inherit. So he keeps going through wives. Some of them get beheaded, beheaded. Some of them get beheaded and some of them are just allowed to um, divorce him and live out the rest of their days in some kind of weird aristocratic exile. Uh, and finally, finally, Jane Seymour, 
produces an heir, and that becomes Edward the Sixth. But he is very young, and when when he succeeds to the throne, right? Because this happens late in Henry's life, and when he succeeds to the throne, he's very much a puppet, and he dies young. And because he dies so young, he has not had a chance to marry. And now we have a succession problem. The other thing that's happening during this time, which we will talk about more with humanism, but the other thing that's happening during this time is <laughs> Protestant Reformation. Henry VIII has broken from the Catholic Church. And he's like, no, fuck this. I'm not a Catholic anymore. I'm a Protestant. And that's really literally not doctrinal. It's because they want a divorce. <laughs> and so... Because he does this, we now have religious wars in England. Mary is Catholic. Elizabeth is Protestant. Edward, I'm pretty sure, is Protestant. Um, I, don't, I don't actually remember. But when Mary succeeds to the throne, after the death of Edward, Mary is married, which means her husband is king, um, Philip of Spain. <laughs> so Philip of Spain is like also king of England, sort of, kind of, not really. Um, but he's Catholic, and this aligns the Catholic the Catholic powers against the English powers, the English and Protestant powers. And now we get like massive major fighting with Spain. Um, so yeah, we have an issue here. Um, also remember this conflict with Spain has higher stakes because during the reign of Henry the seventh is when the North American stuff starts happening. So Henry the seventh is literally the end of, of the War of the Roses. And during his reign, we have Columbus um, on behalf of Spain. And five years later, Britain sends John Cabot. And so he ends up in the farther, much farther north areas. And Spain is farther south. But they're both vying for portions of land there. And so this conflict, this, this religious conflict that's going on in England and the continent is not just about religion. It is also about territory. And that story doesn't get told a lot, that like global story of the Reformation. So that's a thing that's happening. Also, make a mental note here that after Elizabeth, the next heir happens to be James of Scotland, right? So because, because one of Henry and Elizabeth's children on the female side marries the king of Scotland. Make a mental note. We're going to come back to that. So this is, this is the conclusion part right? It's kind of a long conclusion. Buckle up. But why? Why are we talking about all of this? And why the legacy? Um, or what is the legacy? So a lot of times we like to say, isn't it all just ancient history, right? Or the dark ages. And now we live in a civilized modern world, right? What does this have to do with our current lives? Here's the payoff. Um, so John Grenier, which if you remember from Roxanne Dunbar-Artiz, she cites him a lot. He wrote this book, The, the First Way of War, um, American War Making on the Frontier. And he's literally talking about um, the kind of warfare that colonists practiced on native peoples in the Americas. So he claims, he says, irregular warfare is a specifically American way of waging war developed on the frontier. He argues that British forces and their experiences in North America informed their actions towards the Scottish and the Irish, right? So the Scottish, so when they went back, after being in North America, they would go back and they would fight these wars in Scotland and Ireland. And that would impact, that, that brought irregular warfare back from North America, where it originated, into England. But I suggest he's got this backwards. And I think Dunbar Ortiz would agree with me here. I think that this is already a well-honed strategy for the British military forces well before their arrival in the Americas. And I locate that not only in Chevochi, but also in the Saxon and Viking history of England. So let's talk about what is irregular warfare. Um, it has three components that Grenier outlines. It has extirpative war making, and that means extermination, right? Killing large quantities of people who are not 
combatants. Um, that is a part of this. Um, this is certainly true against the indigenous Americans, but we can also see this in Chevochi and siege warfare. Um, they also use specialized units, so usually smaller than a regular army and less effective at regular warfare, where you bring all of your army together and you fight it out on an open battlefield. Um, so yes, the rangers in North America, they are, they are the force of colonization and they are enlisted and they're semi-military, semi like survivalists. And they go out from local townships and they uh, harass and uh, pillage native villages. Yes, that, that qualifies as irregular warfare under Grenier's definition. But the free companies of the Hundred Years' War would also be the same thing. And the first use of the word ranger in the English language actually happens in the description of English military units in Scotland at the beginning of the 14th century. What was happening then? The Scottish Wars of Independence. So rangers, specialized military units, smaller than a regular army, um, that also has a pre-American colonial context as well. And the last component is that it is privatized and commercialized. What you mean, like mercenaries? We've never had we've never had mercenaries involved before. That's not a part of the conversation. Um, yes, in America, this meant bounties for native scalps. Um, so, everybody who thinks that scalping was an indigenous practice, that is not the case. Um, the colonists scalped and they learned how to do it in Ireland. <laughs> um, that was a part of how they subdued the Irish colony first. And so then they came over and they collected scalps from native bodies and they were paid for that. Um, but also war guilt, right? The payment of uh, vassals for their performance in war. And this extended through feudalism, right? Like giving land and goods and money to people who assist you in your war making. We're gonna have, okay, all right, all right. Calm down. Oh no, what's it matter? Are we gonna be raping and pillaging? No? Okay, that's good. All right. So let's connect the dots, right? Yeah. From med medieval Britain to the genocide of indigenous Americans, the two things that we have been discussing thus far. Um, first, the colonization of Scotland. Uh, medieval Britain is a post-colonial society, <laughs> right? It just is. Already. Yeah. Um, between 10 and 40. Love you, you love Grammy? Go get Grammy. Go give her a kiss. Uh, um, between 1040 and 1745, every single English monarch, except for three, they either invaded Scotland or were invaded by Scotland. Um, there was constant conflict on the Scottish border. Uh, that is not new, though right? Like this is not just English monarchs that have this problem. Um, but even today, it's not gone. Um, Scotland has its own parliament and has been actively discussing voting for their own independence, partly because they disagree with Britain so much on leaving the EU. So that's still to be determined, but it does point out that Scotland is an independent country in the United Kingdom and their relationship to England is at best troubled. <laughs> um, okay, but remember, we, here we were. Um, this is the lineage of Scotland from Robert the Bruce. We saw him earlier with the wars, Scottish Wars of Independence and his direct lineage goes all the way down. This is the House of Stuart, um, all the way down to blah, 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 blah. Here are the Scottish kings. Most of them are Catholic, which, in the you know in in the wars of religion is a big deal scotland and england don't have the same religion and then the people within the various countries align with the not their national side but instead with their religious affinity and it, it gets very very messy 
the outcome here is that after Elizabeth dies without an heir, her cousin, James of Scotland, he is James the sixth king of Scotland. Um, he becomes James the first king of England and he unifies England and Scotland by being the legitimate heir to both. Voila. <laughs> there, that happens. Um, and so you do get a temporary halt to war with Scotland during James's reign. This is solidly Renaissance now, right? Um, but that shit does not stay locked down for long <coughs> because, and again, there will be a more detailed lecture on this later, but just to like highlight so that you can organize this timeline in your mind, we have James and then his successor is Charles the first who instigates the English Civil War and loses his head. And then in between him and the next king is Oliver Cromwell, Lord Protector, the Puritans. It's a whole thing. And then his son, Charles II, comes out of exile. He takes the throne again. And James II is the heir after Charles II because they don't have any kids. And James II is Catholic. And so it all starts again right but that's scotland when it isn't scotland it's ireland <laughs> remember this the angevin empire this starts with henry the second trying to colonize ireland um but it doesn't stop there there's there's the norman invasion of ireland um and actually they're pretty successful um but then they get pushed back and by the time of 1450 they have um, kind of had it back and forth several times and now you have a very tenuous hold in Ireland where the Greenlands here these are native Irish lords um, and the purple ones are held by Anglo-Irish so what they do the Normans here is when they conquer a space they depose the local Irish ruler especially if they're Catholic uh, wait no we're not in the in Protestant versus Catholic yet. Sorry, 1300. They deposed the Irish rulers and they replaced them with Anglo-Irish settlers or usually these are Anglo-Scottish settlers. So these are folks who do not have their own aristocracy back in Britain, um, but they can become a lord by going over to Ireland, making a name for the, themselves fighting and earning a kingdom, right? Or a dukey, an estate. Um, or here, no, we have earldoms, excuse me. Um, and then there is a certain part of Ireland called the Pale, and this is land that belongs directly to the king. Um, so that phrase, beyond the Pale, that literally comes from this context where if something is beyond the Pale, it's unbelievable, it is outside the circumstances of normal life, they're literally saying, um, they're out there in crazy Celt land, wildlings. That's literally where this comes from. Um, yay, language. Um, but we're not quite done. Remember these guys? So now we are in, this is Henry, Elizabeth, James, uh, Charles, and then Charles and James. Um, and James and eventually is convinced to abdicate uh, because they're making war and he allows his daughter Mary to succeed to the throne because she is Protestant and that is what folks are demanding and if he doesn't then off with his head uh, that kind of thing anyway Mary and her husband William of Orange they become William and Mary right this is supposed to be the renaissance the early modern period right surely surely we're more civilized uh, but what we find is that that's not the case so in the 16th and 17th centuries in ireland the english conquest proceeded with the kinds of restraints um, oh, sorry, without, that should say without, proceeded without the kinds of constraints that characterize military activities between nation states in the 18th century. The English quite consciously used unlimited warfare to subdue the, direct quote, heathen and savage Irish. <laughs> 
So these are direct quotes from Grenier and the way that he describes this. Uh, At the center of the English military solution to the problem of Ireland was a dependence on the feed fight, so starvation, um, chevochi, terrorism, and indiscriminate killing of non-combatants. That is how they subdue Ireland. And not just in the Norman, the Anglo-Norman invasion of Ireland in 1300 or in the ensuing wars from 1300 to 1450. We are now talking about the 1500s, Henry VIII, and the 1600s, so James, Jacobean, William Shakespeare, that kind of time. Um, (laughs) And... By the 18th century, this kind of war is kind of on the outs, but we'll, we'll, we'll get to that. Um, so there are three main factors to why the English treat the Irish this way. Number one, they perceived Ireland to be a land specifically for exploitation, um, a, a place, quote to quote Grenier, capable of enriching England, but only if they could turn the troublesome Irish into a tractable peasantry. Number two, the divisions within Irish society between Protestants and Catholics, um, this division was, so this is my little insert, was basically ensured by the the internal religious struggles for the English crown, uh, right? Some were Catholic, some were Protestant, and they were always fighting amongst themselves. And so the Irish, as this goes on, some are Catholic, most are Catholic. Some are Protestant because they're Anglo-Irish settlers or they married Anglo-Irish settlers or they converted. Um, And so they have more alliances based on their religion than their native land. And so this gets really, really messy. And in turn, it takes on the fervor of a religious war, particularly when you have Irish Catholics against Irish Protestants aligned with the English throne. And this gets very very bloody um right (laughs) and to be clear when we say wars of religion we are talking about the protestant um catholic wars not the crusades but but anyway same difference um england had also had no military establishment in ireland or faced no military, right? So the Irish don't have a regular military. They're not a continental European power. Um, That is not the role that they have played in history up to this point. Um, They have really been kind of a remote backwater, if you will, a rural area um, that largely stays out of the way of everybody but Vikings because Vikings sail. (laughs) Um, So their response is to try to drive the English out by any means possible. They don't have a regular military. So the Irish men and women, yes, both women, uh, or men and women, uh, they use the tools of irregular warfare, which are arson, murder, and terrorism, to oppose British occupation of their homeland. And I will just pause here to note that this has not ended entirely. There is a very fragile piece in Northern Ireland right now, which belongs to England. It is the county of Ulster, mostly Protestant Irish folks, but not entirely. And um, this Belfast is located there. But in the 90s, there was a series of violent, um, you might say, terrorist attacks on on behalf of the IRA, the Irish Republican Army, um, who were attempting to liberate Ireland from England's rule. And one of the things that they used were terror tactics, terrorism tactics, um, including suicide bombings. Uh, so when you do not have a regular military, sometimes your only means of exercising power over a superior military force is to use tactics of terrorism. Um, so Grenier says those factors combined to make Ireland in English circles, a place where conventional norms of military behaviors did not apply. So the English essentially felt themselves able to do any kind of, uh, I don't want to use the word monstrosity. That's not right. Um, nothing was too criminal 
because this land was uncivilized. Um, but apparently this did become distasteful at some point in like normal war between European countries. And it seems at least Hugo Grotius, uh, 15, you know, 1583, 1645, he says, he writes this treatise on the morality of warfare and what should and should not be done. And he specifically says that non-combatants are never legitimate targets for armies. And there is a good argument to be made that he says this because of how bloody the Protestant versus Catholic wars actually were. Um, there were 8 million dead in Germany alone. <laughs> like, that is a lot. Like, th that is on the scale of a Holocaust. And during a time when the population was not as large. So that's a massive, massive number. Um, and so what we see is, yes, there is distaste for irregular warfare, but not when it comes to savages. So even in the 18th century, right, war in the Scottish Highlands, so the farthest reaches and the most mountainous portions of Scotland, um, those are called the Marchlands. Right, a place where traditional rules and civilized behavior did not apply because they were fighting wild and barbarous Highlanders. Um, they also did not apply to the heathen and savage Irish, and they did not apply to indigenous peoples of the Americas. Right, savages are an exception. Um, and the outcome of this is that newly colonized peoples are redeployed to colonize other folks. So what you see here is a map of Ireland uh, and the, the Anglo-Irish settlements that were established and under whose rule, right? So these gray areas remained under Irish lordship. Uh, but here we have, um, let's see, Mary. Mary gets in there, uh, which, go figure, she's Catholic, okay. And then there's Elizabeth, Right, she takes this big corner, and then early on, James of uh, James the first, he takes this big swoop, and then a little later, he comes back and he gets all of these, um, and then these are private lordships, but they are aligned with Anglo interests, and these are not conquests; these are plantations. That is the literal word in which Anglo lords ruled over. Irish plantations. <laughs> and the primary people who have been employed to do this are the not that long ago conquered Scottish, right? Particularly the Protestant Scottish nobility. So a lesser noble, you know, maybe a second son who's not going to inherit at home in Scotland, um, he can now become a lord of his own kingdom or his own little uh, earldom, really, or plantation in Ireland. So uh, the Scots assist with the colonization of Ireland because the English provide this gift of land to them after fighting, in, like in exchange for conquest. And this is the same thing as vassalage. It's just that instead of war geld, like war gold and rings, they are now giving land. Um, and then this creates a Scots-Irish settlement, an Anglo-Scots-Irish people, many of whom become the, the, the lower classes of which become the Scots-Irish settlers that emigrate to the American colonies, particularly those who, again, are second sons or lesser nobility, and they want to try and establish themselves. And there's no more land left here, but there's more land in North America. Um, and this is from familiar folks, right? We go right back to this, like, Renaissance period of supposedly enlightened people and this is who is perpetuating this irregular warfare against first the Scottish and the Irish and now the indigenous Americans. So what we see in Ireland foreshadows what we should expect 
in the Americas. So Grenier points out the raids in Ireland of 1641 and 42, no exception to the wanton destruction, and that is aimed at reducing an entire population to submission or starvation and therefore dependence on their conquerors. That is the goal. If you don't have a house and you don't have food, then you must rely on what we give you. And now you are not only conquered, but you are subjugated. So Cook's account of uh, George Cook, he's one of the one of the leaders of Anglo forces in Ireland at, at, during this raid. He um, actually a later one, 10 years later, um, he accounts for or he describes these feed fights. Um, and he says, we found great stores of corn, which is just the universal word for grain. It doesn't mean maize, um, which we burnt. Also, all the houses and cabins we could find. Um, and we burned and destroyed for four days. And any time we needed uh, provision, we had it, right? Housing to lie in and food to eat. And after we were done with it, we burnt it to the ground. And we burnt our quarters every morning and we continued burning all the day after. Like we just burned and burned and burned everything down. Burn it all down. Um, the other practice that should be familiar now is forced relocation. The most So Grenier says, the most successful and largest scale irregular practice that the English inflicted on the Irish was the expropriation of Irish lands and the forced transportation of Irish peoples to the West Indies in, and North America. So these are the indentured servants that arrive here. And this is really important because this is simultaneous with the rise of the transatlantic slave trade, right? There are slaves in Virginia already, 1619. But their status is not yet fixed. And we're going to talk more about that in a couple of weeks. But just bear in mind that this fact leads directly to the struggle. This fact that there are black folks who are enslaved and there are enslaved Irish. And this leads to the struggle between poor in, enslaved or indentured whites, um, often of Scotch Irish descent. And they want to be one rung above enslaved Africans, right? In the social hierarchy or so we, so they think, uh, but actually what's happening here and we'll talk about it like i said with bacon's rebellion but the anglo ruling class perpetuates this animosity specifically because they recognize the danger of these two disenfranchised classes finding solidarity and working together to overthrow their less numerous anglo masters right so the practice of rounding everyone up, dispossessing them from their ancestral homelands, and then shipping them off to somewhere else. That's not new in the Americas. That is a timeless classic for English warfare. Um, so we get to the end of this lecture, and I know it's way, way long. I told you I wanted to make sure I did my due diligence, but partly because we've been we we spent our first uh, section of class really thinking about our current situation and the indigenous peoples in the places that we occupy and how we got to where we are and we learned a lot by looking backwards from where we are and then we rewind rewound i don't know rewinded then we went back and tried to start from the beginning. And we noticed that the beginning is also problematic. It's not Anglo-Saxon. Uh, that's not even real. Uh, and where we choose to put the beginning matters. Do we talk about Romans? Do we talk about Celts? I mean, we do, obviously, because we did. But in other circumstances, people start with the Saxons and then they go forward. Um, and this leads to a periodization of history that gets built into the tools we have for thinking about our current world. So this is the connection between past and present. So the next era, which we are going to turn to, right? Like this is the least amount of time I have ever 
spent on medieval literature <laughs> in a class that purportedly covers it. But after after next week, this week, right? So you're you're assuming I'm assuming that you're watching this a week from the day that I'm recording it. Um, so the next thing we're going to turn to is the early modern period. And we're going to finish up by thinking through how this period, the early modern period, connects us between where we started, which is where are we now? And then the next thing we explored, which is where did it all begin? And in the middle of those two questions is the early modern period. So this was originally, not originally, that's not the right word. Um, this used to be called the Renaissance. And the term has come under fire lately, largely because it, there are some contemporary Italian references to something like a rebirth, but it was a limited application. But in the 19th century, a couple of historians, um, Swiss and French, argued that this moment in history that we think of as the Renaissance was a particular flourishing of arts and cultural um, and science and learning um, after an era that was bizarre and monstrous. That's what Michelet called the Middle Ages, um, but really barbarous, right? Barbaric and unlearned and the middle, the middle from Middle Ages comes from this idea of a renaissance, a rebirth, right? So you can't, if you have a rebirth, then you have to have had a birth. And the birth is classical Greece and Rome. And then it dies. And there's a rebirth. And in the middle <laughs> is the Middle Ages, <laughs> the medium avum, right? And so you can't have a Middle Ages without both a classical and a Renaissance. Otherwise, there's nothing in the middle. And being in the middle is kind of an improvement over the term Dark Ages, which implies there was no learning, but also the term enlightenment that is later used to talk about the age of reason, another term we're going to question, um, but the dark ages versus enlightenment actually uses a coded racialized vocabulary itself, right? Like, let's not forget that the language of dark equaling uncivilized and light equaling civilized, that has its roots in a racial vocabulary. So when we're talking about the 19th century being the time that we develop a vocabulary for talking about the Middle Ages, <laughs> um, that vocabulary already has a racialized meaning, right? So the Dark Ages are being equated with a kind of European primitivism, uncivilized, like cultures with dark peoples, right? And the European enlightenment, like the white race, is inherently more civilized and therefore superior. Like that is coded into that language. So the way that we talk about these periods of time directly affects how we conceptualize our relationship to history. Um, so... The more common term here is early modern, and that has replaced Renaissance, but I would argue that it's not any better, right? So if we are modern, capital M, not modernist, but modern, um, then to label a specific period as early modern is to say like, this is as far back into history as we can reach and see ourselves, recognize modern humans, because we align with some of the values of this moment. And whatever is before that, we do not recognize, right? That becomes the, the temporal other, right? And we banish all things to that, that space, that time. We banish all things to that time that we think are barbaric, or violent, 
or steeped in traditions of faith instead of scientific reason. Like all of that is medieval, right? We use that terminology to imply barbaric and violent and uncivilized. And most importantly, it says we, modern people, are not like them, barbaric medieval folks. So the language that we use to talk about the things that we study is steeped in a history that is built around colonization, subjugation, and racialization. So I'm going to end here just drawing, drawing us back around full circle, right? The complex situation in England, um, in Britain, throughout the Middle Ages and the early modern period, if that's what you want to call it, um, and the humanist period, maybe, um, that is not, here, I'm going to go back, right? We'll have something to look at. Um, what we see in our spaces, our modern moments, is not medieval. I mean, it is. It has origins in the Middle Ages, but it doesn't stay there. So we still participate in irregular warfare. We still target enemy non-combatants. Like we, that is still a standard operating procedure. And it's not just that it still is. For us as a country, as Americans, Anglo-Americans, um, it always has been. And it has been since before this, even. It has been since England, since before England. And that behavior, that way of warfare, that propagation of genocide, that is built into every aspect of the institutions that continue to exist in the way that they do today.